All right, everybody, here it is. It is Monday, January 25th. Welcome to another episode of Let There Be Talk number 575. That's what episode it is today. Holy smokes. I want to thank all of you for tuning in every week. If you are new here from uh, hearing me on the Bill Burt podcast, welcome and thank you for uh, taking the ride. It was great to be on Bill Burt's podcast uh, a couple days ago. A lot of people dug it, which uh, felt good. Felt good. I was on there talking about my new podcast, The Grail. I was shouting out all the great handmade stuff. And people seem to have uh, dug it. So thank you so much for that. I think back to a year ago this month. This is the last week in January. And last year I did a full dedication to thrash metal music, thrash January. It kind of makes sense to have this man on today. At the end of January here, kind of a continuation of thrash January. We have Mr. Phil Demo here. From Violence, formerly of Machine Head, uh, Bay Area metalhead like myself. I've known this man many, many, many years, and it's uh, so great to sit down and talk to him. Kind of a celebration of both of us being alive still, which which is not guaranteed out there. But he had some killer stories talking about the old days of uh the omni and the stone and and uh thrash metal filling in for gary holt and slayer and uh some machine head talk all of that stuff and just great great human killer guitar player killer guitar player so thank you phil for doing the show and i hope to get to see you soon in person somehow one day get rid of this goddamn uh this goddamn fucking voodoo going across the planet get back to uh enjoying life in the meantime i'm glad we have each other with this uh podcast and patreon and instagram and twitter and all that stuff good shit my friends uh don't forget to subscribe to the grail my second podcast the grail podcast with dean del rey it is on itunes and uh google play and libsyn and youtube all of that stuff uh subscribe to it i have every week somebody cool on there that makes cool shit or does cool stuff uh shout out to the new patreoner or not new he bumped up his pledge david bros bros thank you so much i do have a patreon.com slash dean del rey all your bonus episodes and we do do a zoom fest every week where i invite everybody on a big large uh zoom party which is very cool good to see all you out there okay okay let's get to the episode huh before we do I don't know, I went into an accent there. I know a lot of guitar players are going to be listening to this episode. I have got the fucking great sponsor for you guitar players, the Guitar Guru Network. These guys have all of your equipment needs, great deals, massive selection of stuff like Friedman amps, diesel, Bogner, Engel amps, Jackson Guitars, EVH, Charvel, and ESP, as well as Schechter. All the guitars. Great stuff. They also got great uh, audio stuff. Universal Audio, Eventide, Warm Audio, Apogee Pro Audio Gear. It can all be found on Reverb.com, the Guitar Guru Network. If you want to follow him on Instagram, it is the underscore guitar underscore guru underscore network. I'm telling you, perfect spot for all your guitar needs. The guitar guru is killing it out there. Massive great reviews on Reverb. People love this man and all of uh, his company's equipment. I was looking at the uh, Eddie Van Halen's he has on there, which tomorrow 
would have been Eddie Van Halen's 66th birthday. God damn it, that still fucking hurts. The loss of Eddie Van Halen. Um, anyway, the Guitar Guru Network is a sponsor of Let There Be Talk, which means that is a friend of yours now. Go to Reverb.com and find them. Get your Charvels, your ESPs, your Schecters, and uh, any other guitar needs. Thank you, Guitar Guru Network, for uh, sponsoring the podcast. You guys got great stuff. Let's get into it right now. Let's start our week off with some thrash metal. My man Phil Demel. Candles are lit. Look who's on the screen right here. How the hell are you, buddy? Introduce yourself. Good, man. Phil Dimmel from uh, from Violence presently. <laughs> Did you almost say Machine Head? <laughs> I almost say a lot of things, man. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking A, dude. Uh, man, I've been wanting to get you on the show for a long time. Of course, I hit you up years ago, and you said you couldn't do the show because there, there was these rules and machine head and i was like what are you even fucking talking about and uh so yeah i'm not i'm never a guy that brings up the drama i always like to celebrate the um the uh the good shit but i did want to cover that just so people you know people are like well you did the fucking thrash january you didn't have bill (laughs) on man I mean, I'm like, hey, I can't sit here and tell you all the behind the scenes politics right. of booking podcast guests, you know? <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. Uh, good shit. That that sounds like an oxymoron. But uh, so, yeah, there was a period where um, I wasn't allowed to do press and told not to do uh, was kind of limiting even endorsement possibilities and, and doing uh uh, stuff with my endorsers was being really limited down to really basically not really doing anything. So um, that was all on the, all on the backside of it. So I, I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up. Cause I don't remember that we were at that point. So it's like, okay, then, cause I know we've been talking about doing it. And I thought it was just kind of like a scheduling thing, but you know, that's, Oh yeah, that was, that's, that's right. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, there was a point, uh, and, and I can be totally honest. I'm not going to sit here and go, Oh, I was a big machine head fan. I didn't listen to machine head at all, but when the blackening came out, I thought it was one of the greatest metal records ever made. And immediately was fucking floored by this record and listened to it for about a year straight in 2007. I was, and I also was, um, I was so, happy that a band could create something so great deep in their careers all the way from violence through machine head and all that to make what i would think would be the two of yours uh best work ever and and one of the greatest bay era records ever all oh, right on man that's that that's awesome uh it's it was kind of yeah they were deep in their in, in machine head's career but it was it was my i want to say maybe fourth year with him and second record uh when i joined i contributed a little bit to the through the ashes record but this was the record where we had been together we had toured we had been together for three three years or so and we were starting to write i was uh you know in my previous band torque which was like violence without the singer so i was you know i worship machine head they were just you know i was used to writing like that and now i could actually use riffs that sound like machine head because i'm in the fucking band you know it's just like okay now i can you know it's like in violence yeah oh that sounds too much like slayer you know but it's just like all right now my machine head riffs actually fit a machine head so us writing together really came together and and uh, we gelled at that point, and it was it was really magical for uh, the four of us all being together and, and contributing in that sense. What was that uh, process like on that? And we're going to get through your whole career and everything, but this thing was so monumental to me when it came out. It was like just this, I mean, all of a sudden you guys are on the, the Metallica tour. <laughs> uh, Metallica loves this record, and, and in all honesty... I do think it influenced them to get back into 
being heavy again and finding their own uh, way back to what they used to do, you know? So what was that process like? Were you demoing? Were you just writing on the road? How did this thing cr be created? We weren't really a band that writes on the road. You know, we were always get in the jam room and do it. We were, the shows were about the shows and rehearsing for that and sound checks were for that. So we took a good, man, it was a long, it was supposed to come out in 2006, but we had, uh, Rob took some time off to do the Roadrunner United record. And that was like in the middle of our writing process. So we had two kind of writing sessions where the beginning was kind of my tunes that I brought in uh, beautiful morning and slanderous. And um, so they're the shorter songs, you know, we didn't even know we were going to write these 10 minute epics until later on. And that session kind of ended with now I lay thee down, which was kind of this, this tool kind of riff that I came up with and Rob put together the chorus to it. So that was like this, we were in a rut, you know, we were kind of in a rut and, uh, he actually hadn't brought a lot to the table in the beginning. It was mostly my my kind of ideas. And and then so I think that was the song that brought us, you know, kind of melded. We were on the phone going, hey, and humming, humming, humming riffs to each other. And I think that was the song that kind of really brought us together and got the rest of the the record going. You know, it was, you know, I James and the guys in Metallica were like, man, that record was really, they're so proud of the Bay Area. You know, they're so entrenched here and even now that they a lot of them don't live here anymore they're they're just so proud of it and i think that hearing a record like that um i think it did influence them to go like fuck this is you know this is what we enjoy and let's try doing this and you know death magnetic came out had a lot of those heavy moments again and um i truly believe that i truly believe that getting asked to do you know some shows with them and we were on tour with Slipknot overseas and um, and I, I I went through this period of passing out on stage and having these these episodes and uh, we had to pull off. I One happened in, I want to say Sheffield, and we had two days left and we're supposed to, you know, Lamb of God can't play the Forum or they couldn't play the LA Forum. Yeah. And so Metallica's doing two shows there and they ask us to play. So we pull off of the Slipknot thing and try to I go see a doctor and try to figure some shit out and, you know, going and seeing them and having them tell us all these, you know, stories of, it was just a magical moment. You got, you know, Dave Grohl's doing uh, fun, you know, beer funnels out and out in the parking lot and, you know, and it's just, it was just, that's when we're kind of noticing just the global awareness of what that, that record was kind of doing. It, it's pretty unreal. Uh, and it does kind of come down to when you think about if people stick together or I don't even want to say stick together when the right pieces are in there, which would be you and Rob and have this chemistry, you know, bands have chemistry and then they get new members and it goes away and you never capture that chemistry again. Chemistry is almost impossible to get in the first place, you know, from answering ads in BAM magazine. Uh, I mean, you got to think about what is uh what kind of magic have to happen? Look at this long hair has bass and pro transportation, right. uh, will, willing to do it all, you right. know, and, and slowly you put pieces together and then some kind of fucking magic happens in a shitty room in Oakland, you know, rehearsing. Yeah. So for that to come all together again and put out what is probably the best metal record of the 2000, uh, the early 2000s, hands down, was just mind boggling to me. And, you know, and then to go do those shows with uh, Metallica, very cool. Let's talk a little bit about that. You you were sick and uh, you didn't know what it was. You would just pass out on stage, right? I know you've talked about it, but I wanted to know myself because we're in an age where people get sick. You don't know what it is and it's scary. Yeah, I had uh, episodes when I was younger, maybe 15 years prior of, um, just passing out, you know, I'd feel it. You feel it come on your hands, get clammy and you're just like, fuck, you know, and you, sometimes you go down, sometimes you lay down and you're all right. But, um, it hadn't happened in a while. And, uh, it was, I we're playing in Milan and, uh, we're playing the black crusade is, you know, sold out arena tour that we're doing with trivium and dragon force and arch enemy and shadows fall. And, um, and, 
we're playing a song called Descend the Shades of Night. And it's about, it's a song about death. And my dad was in kind of declining health. And, you know, I think about him on stage and, you know, sometimes cry and just, you know, and this one night, man, I, I pass out on stage during this song and, you know, we find out we we're nominated for a Grammy and I call home, you know, and the, the phone doesn't answer and all this. And, um, so the next day I found out that my father died oh. and, and, and so it's just like, fuck, you know, it was pretty shocking. We did, you know, you know, he had diabetes. He was, you know, had was going through dialysis and all this. And so, uh, bass player Dave was like, dude, what time did this happen at? And, you know, trying to put, I'm like, fuck, I, you know, got out of dialysis two o'clock. We just do the math. And it's just like, fuck, you know, you realize that's just about the time when you passed out on stage is when it, you know, wow. when it, so is that's kind of the trigger and it's, ha it happened, you know, it, it's, I haven't had like clinical depression, but you know, you've, when you're grieving and you go through a depressive state and, um, it, it happened like a handful of times after that, two or three times on stage. And, um, turns out I have my vasal vagal nerve on my heart is kind of malfunctions and, uh, it doesn't. So like your, your, your mind is communicating with your heart and it's telling when the adrenaline to kick in, Hey, your, your rates falling pretty quick here. You need to kick that adrenaline in. And, you know, sometimes it gets kind of lost in the shuffle and it doesn't make it there. So you just like, Hey, you better fucking, you, well, you need wow. to pass out. So if I feel it coming on, I can lay down and reset. It hasn't happened in a long time. And um, is there any kind of a cure for that? Or is it just kind of a, uh, a thing you ride out? Yeah, it's, it's something, I mean, I could get a pacemaker done if it gets acute and it's seemed, and I was close to doing that at one point. Um, but I've, it's, it hasn't happened in a long time. I feel great. You know, things are, it's going through quite a lot back there in the mid two thousands, yeah. uh, pretty nasty child custody battle. And, oh, shit. um, so just, you know, the loss of my father and all these things are fucking happening. Uh, uh so it's, you get, you get through certain situations and your body kind of, you know, adjust to it. So I've been feeling great, you know, yeah. married going on 10 years now and got, you know, a bunch of kids and another one on the way. And <laughs> oh, damn. Damn. Oh, the pandemic's not good for you. Income. Oh, man. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. There's one incoming for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's go back to the early days. I mean, we all uh, were running around in the same circles and stuff. Um, you know, all that, that stuff. Uh, I don't know if you were going to like Antioch concert barn. Oh yeah. 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 Dio. Dio. Yeah, yes. That. Dio. That's first Dio show with that Ever. lineup. Yeah. 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 Rough, rough cut and paradox open. Yeah. And yeah. What a venue, right? I know. We're the, like, where are we going? My buddy had just got his license. So it's like the first of our friends just got his license and we all piled in his crappy Audi and we had the record and it was so fucking good, you know, and Vivian is ripping and like, who's this guitar player? And, and uh, it was, it was a, amazing show it really was it really yeah. was the venue was all muddy there was yeah. like, i think there was like two bathrooms outside was, right. <laughs> i really like to know the history of the antioch concert barn some people said it was just some guy's barn and he wanted to start doing shows but shit man i, I saw two shows there and you know deal first show right. with the lineup right, right, i got right. it on cassette i got a bootleg of it no way yeah everybody I'm, I'm, I'm going to transfer it over to uh, digital and then uh, just put it out there for fun. So people can hear that. That's really cool. But that early days, where were you, where'd you grow up? Like in Walnut Creek or out there, East Bay, where were you? I'm, I grew up in this house that I'm in right now, man. Dublin, California. Wow. Dublin, <laughs> Dublin, Dublin, you know, Chuck Billy and yep. Zet and, you know, all those dudes from here. Troy Lucetta is actually, uh, from Tesla. So he's, he's my second cousin, wow. you know? Yeah. I didn't even figure that out until I was in my twenties, you know, and we didn't even meet each other until 2007, but wow. this little town has produced a lot of, you know, a lot of legendary dudes. And, but we had violence was kind of like, I joined violence my senior year in high school. We're called death penalty. And then we were going out to Ruthie's we're going, we were introduced to the stone and we we're introduced to all this, you know, getting to know all the bands and death angels and the possess and, you know, watching Exodus and, you know, seeing Slayer for their first time up here at the Keystone Berkeley. And yeah. 
So I think are I think you might be Mike a year or two older than me. I'm 54. You're 53, right? Yeah, I'll be 54 in April. So we're right about the same. Right, right. So we, you know, getting to know the different cities and hanging out with the Berkeley people and uh, and the city crowd and uh, going to all those shows. And then that's where I think I met you doing, did you work for California concerts? Or I did. Yeah. For, I, booked, uh, I booked the stone and, and uh, Jimmy booked the Omni. And then we did Cal, uh, we did Fresno together, Cadillac club. Right. So violence did the Cadillac a couple yeah. of times. Yeah. And, but that's where I, I, I you were, uh, saw you hanging around and you would do your birthday show. Yeah. And you had, you know, it was always ACDC tunes and doing covers. And so I got, uh, some of the dudes, uh, Joey from Joey and Brent from pigs played, uh, Rob played me and Rob played guitar, and then Dean, our bass player, sang. And we did uh, How I Ain't a Bad Place to Be at one of your jam, and that's where we met for the first time. Wow, man, you actually played a church of Bon Scott, like, yes. uh, yeah, wow, I didn't even fucking know that because <laughs> you know, because they're all kind of a blur. I did them every year, right? And then when I think, I go, Oh, yeah, I remember we had Paul Gilbert. And Paul Gilbert Brad. said, I'm not, I'm not playing guitar. I want to play drums. We had Paul <laughs> Gilbert one year. Awesome. Uh, the Death Angel guys all did it. Uh, right. But I think it was as um, not Swarm, the one before it. Uh, organization? Organization. I think they did it right. as the, oh, we had uh, Mind Zone guys, which were the oh, right on. guys. Right, right, right. Uh, yeah, a lot of uh, Bay Area guys. And we would put that together. And uh, I that was, was a good time. Yeah, it really was. Yeah. I kind of remember and and see if you can touch on this a little bit, because I don't know if ever anybody's ever talked about it, but I remember there was a time I guess violence was going on and Rob had some uh, run in with a ga with gang members or something over by the Omni or so. What was that? Do you remember that? Well, that's pretty much what started Machine Head and ended his time in violence. <laughs> He he was at the he was at the A and PM right on the corner. I'd eat and, there all the time. Fifty cent burgers, and I think that yeah, right, yeah. And I guess uh, a a group a gang kind of rolled up on him and one of his buddies, and one of his buddies pulled out a knife or something. I don't I don't know if I have all the facts exactly right, but they wanted. So I think one of Rob's buddies, you know, cut up the, the gang pretty bad. So they knew that Rob had been involved. And so that Rob was in this band and they were going to come down to the Omni and like blow up the Omni or something like that when we were playing or. Yeah. And so we had agreed even before then that he had already started. He wanted to do a side project and he wanted to do both. And we were like, no, he can't do both. And so that was the end of his time in violence. Dude, that was like actually kind of scary shit because I remember we were getting these, uh, the word like, hey, man, because we at the time we were booking underneath the Omni in the offices right. down there. And right. they're like, yeah, man, they're threatening to blow up uh, unless people tell where he lives and shit. Oh my we're, God. Just, we're just kind of like, uh, I mean, it's really, really faint in my mind because it's right. so long ago. But I, did remember it was an incident at that AM PM on the corner. And, mm. and, and then, you know, we were like, is that real? Or was it for press or what? You know what I mean? but, it was real. Yeah. yeah. That shit that, uh, you know, the Omni was in a actual real crack, uh, riddled gang, uh, infested neighborhood for sure. And that was when crack was really ground zero in, in Oakland and mm. changed the whole climate of Oakland. It's funny. If you read the East Bay dragons, uh, the black motorcycle clubs book, uh, they talk about the crack filtering into Oakland and completely changing it instantly overnight, which is why. Oh, really? Holy crap. Yeah. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. There were some moments walking out into the, I don't know if it was at the bank parking lot across the street where you usually park and, yeah. and, somebody one of my buddies like mouthed off to somebody that was there and they met us around in the parking lot had a gun to his head threw a flashlight at me and hit me in the mouth and it just fucking like this is you don't fuck around down here man, nah, man. Like, they had uh, that crack house across the street remember that right, right, right. Yeah. yeah yeah it was just fucking haunted mansion i used to call it yeah <laughs> insane <laughs> It's interesting listening to violence now as I went back and listened to the first record. Uh, it's funny that I never really put it together, but 
Sean had way more of kind of a circle jerks, dead Kennedy's delivery than anybody. And as I listened to it last night again, I was like, fuck, this is pretty damn cool. This vocal styling, you know, especially on the, uh, on the, um, uh title track you know right, right right uh it was really kind of uh he was kind of punk rock and then of course you guys had the thrash metal sound he was the he was always the tipping point like either you either you loved it or you hated it there was no in between with the and that's where people kind of went with our band they said because we're you know we're a thrash band there's no dynamics you know and and I loved I loved it personally. Super original. Uh, some of the best lyrics that you know that I anybody that I've been involved with writing lyrics is super clever and smart and witty. And uh, so getting back together and jamming with him now and writing this record now, we're actually doing pre pro. We're starting drums next Monday for a five song EP. So getting to do that again with him is I've forgotten how good he was at at writing lyrics and, and, uh, you know, I'm about to go somewhere. I don't want to go. So <laughs> if I can just stop and, uh, but it, it has been really refreshing and really super cool to be creating with somebody like, that. well, uh, like I said, listening to him now and, uh, really digging into it last night, I was like, God damn, this is, uh, this is pretty fucking cool. Um, I mean, you know, these people, had their styles. A lot of people didn't like Bailoff. I loved him, you know, but mm -hmm. he was not your classic great singer. But he, was, uh, he wasn't a singer at all. Right, right. <laughs> and, and and Tom Mariah, you know, uh, I mean, and James Hetfield and all the early thrash vocals, it wasn't about being a great singer or whatever. It was about the fucking the attitude and the um the delivery and the the potency of the front man, you know, right, just like right. you fucking do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like but uh, listening to it, like I said last night, really, really cool, man. I was like, oh, I'll, I'll be listening to this record again, you right. know. Oh, that's cool, right? When you guys were putting that together back in the day, where did you where did you find him? Or was uh, I mean, I know you put it, you put it, you joined what in eighty three or something, eighty five. When I joined, there were dudes from Dublin High. Well, they were, they were, they were registered to be at Dublin High. Yeah, Chuck, Chuck Billy's brother Ed was playing bass. Perry, the present drummer, was was there. Uh, guitar player was Troy Fua, and original singer Jerry Burr. They all kind of, as I joined, um, they kind of Ed went away. All within you know a year or two, they have, Jerry moved away. Um, who had then we got Sean. So Dean Dell was kind of, he played in a band called Terminal Shock and he was kind of, he knew he was in pictures with Gary and, you know, James and he knew the Metallica dudes, you know, he was just, he was a scene kid and yeah. could, could kind of play the bass, but he looked cool. So, you know, yeah. Um, but Sean was a friend of Dean's and he would come to practice and he would have, he had this horrible long mustache, you know, his original mustache and, uh, he would always have, you know, a, a thing of smearing off and a thing of orange juice. Uh -huh. And he, he would just sit back and just kind of, he'd have this stupid fucking laugh, you know, and he, he was, he's the dude who like says something and just laughs at his own jokes, you know? Yeah. yeah. And so he just, you know, we needed a singer and he said, yeah, you know, I've never done it before. I want to try it. And, you know, stepped in and just rewrote all my lyrics and for, for a good thing, you know? And, uh, and just became, we were just, you know, we, we took off. We were more of a live band. Once we started playing with other bands, we moved a lot on stage. We, uh, we were really involved with the, with the crowd. And so it's, it's people remembered it. And then the tune started to, you know, to catch on a little bit. So. And you guys were kind of the second phase of the thrash scene uh, coming out. Like, I mean, the record didn't come out till 88. So, you mm -hmm. know, we're talking about right when appetite for destruction hits right, right, right. And, uh, and, and Jane's addiction, uh, right. you know, nothing shocking. So right. there's a different landscape about to happen. Maybe if the record came out two years before uh, it might've even been bigger. Right. 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 I think so. I, I you know, I, I almost think that we're like the third wave, you know, the Metallica and Exodus and then the death angel, a testament, you know, cause we were opening for them 
and then it's just like us and forbidden and defiance you know we're kind of maybe that 2a stage or whatever because death angel and testament were were you know light years ahead of what we were doing and and we knew it and we were super jealous about it <laughs> and <laughs> and because we were super young super cocky and uh and I think that was the downfall. We just expected we were we felt too entitled and um made some bad decisions. You know, we fired Debbie Bono, which I'm sure who you yeah, knew. And of course. And you know she was so indie guy, you know, she was constantly uh, she'd come in, hey Dean, I didn't <laughs> like to get violence on the Slayer gig, you know, and like and then uh, you know, she was so when she was behind a band, man, she yeah. was uh the real deal. It wasn't about money or anything, it was yeah. about I'm gonna work this band. And what what other bad decisions did you guys make? Just maybe label-wise, you know, we were you know, letting go of Debbie pretty much killed the band because she was friends with, we were with Megaforce at the time. So Johnny and Marsha, Marsha just passed away. Oh, yesterday. No, and, God, rest in peace. man. Totally. So she was friends with them. Andy Summers, our booking agent, who I'm sure you knew from back in the of day. Of course, Andy and, Summers. <laughs> and so the label and booking agent, you know, we were supposed to go overseas with Exodus and that, well, sorry, you know, we're dropping you boys. You're no longer on frontier booking, you know? And, and then we just never took hold. And then it was by that way is 91 and, you know, Nirvana's out and Pearl Jam's out and Soundgarden's out. And it's just for a, for a non-dynamic thrash band, it was just time. It was just done. What was the decision to get rid of uh, Debbie? Were you thinking like we could get something bigger or you had kind of hit the ceiling with her or what was it? Um, you know, I was always the, I'm like, you know, like Seinfeld, like even Steven, you know, I'm, I'm always the middle guy. I'm always, the, whatever, I'm always balancing the sides. You know, I had two guys on this side, I had two guys on this side. And, and I think that two guys felt that, you know, they didn't want to go to Denny's and eat together all the time. They wanted a PD. They wanted a bus. They wanted, you know, with Debbie, it was family style. Like we go eat together, you know, because she's paying for it. You know? right, like, right. Right. We're thinking back. It's just like, well, two fifty a show, you know, we're not getting hotels every night. And, you know, so it's, I think the guys just wanted to be maybe growing up and out of, you know, not hanging out with mom all the time. It's, you know, you're 21, you're 22 years old. And if I can, you learn from that. You know, Absolutely. we learned. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I mean, nobody, I've never interviewed an, an artist ever. And they said, I made all the right decisions all the way through my career. <laughs> right. I, I am flawless. I'm 10 for 10 on decisions, manager, label, bandmates, uh, wife. I, I right. nailed it. <laughs> That's never happened ever. I mean, you know, you got artists in the room. And uh, they're all going to clash, you know. For sure, for sure. I've been pretty fortunate in the sense that, you know, I'm I measure my successes by the relationships that I've I've kind of cultivated and being friends with so many people for so long and being able to do the violence thing at the, you know, we didn't tour much, but we went out with Testament on the New Order tour and they showed us, you know, this amazing tour and with our bros that are taking us out. That was awesome. You know, I've got to do a record with Torque with me singing on it. I, you know, I joined Machine Head when I was 30, 36 years old. Grammy and I, nominated. Yeah. And did all these amazing things with that band, headlining festivals and, you know, playing all over the world and 16 year career with them. And I leave that and the next day I'm playing in Slayer. And, you know, the reason why I got goosebumps right now, just thinking about it and playing, and they're the reason why I played heavy music, you know, in high school, I was just like, I could go this, you know, more commercial route with these guys and play. And then I went and saw Slayer at the Keystone Berkeley. And I saw, I just went, I want to, I want to play heavy music, man. This is, this is what I want to fucking do. And that was two years ago and doing all these amazing things. And, uh, jamming with amazing people and playing with my dudes again. This is like almost three stages of career. I'm 54 years old. My wife is pregnant. I've got all these cool prospects as soon as we can play happening, man. I'm, it's so 
I hate saying blessed, you know, because everybody's hashtag blessed, bro. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But I'm fucking hashtag blessed, bro. I'm very, very yeah. fortunate and very lucky to be fucking talking to you all these years later, man. Let's talk a little bit about that Slayer thing. Uh, of course, we all know uh, Gary Holt's father passes and they're in the middle of a tour. You get the call. It's It's got to be real feel really good that you get the call and uh you get the set list and what do you do you just sit down and start learning the 15 song set list and you got to be freaking out you know ending this career with machine head i'm doing this super awkward last tour because i quit but we had the tour set up and i quit a month prior and then oh I, God. I, I, then I go back and go. Well, fuck! It's a dick move to quit and bail on a tour. I mean, if you can't find anybody else to replace me, then I'll, then I'll do the tour, and then you know, Dave quits too. So it's just like, all right, we both have to. So we, we're doing this tour, you know, and it's, it's weird every night. It's cool to say goodbye to the fans, and, but it's, you know, I'm, I'm going from leaving this thing and not even knowing my worth in the industry or knowing if I'm good enough to be in a band, you know, a lot of shitty things were said about me and to me about where I'm questioning, am I even a pro level guitar player, you know? And, and so I, I'm leaving. We, so we played the last show at the catalyst down in, in Santa Cruz. My wife has been home. We bought a bar in Dublin. She's been taking care of the bar. She's been watching our, two-year-old son who's a terror man he's just so much energy and like i'm finally coming home my wife is coming down to the show i'm all come on down i'll drive us home get fucked up you know let loose and so she comes down and i see her raging with the other you know the other wives and she's like smoke a pot in the pit and she's pitting and i'm like oh, holy crap <laughs> and at one point I look at her and she's got, you know, my old drug tech would call it hunting and fishing. So got, she's got one eye up in the air. One, there's like, one, one, this way, one, I'm like, oh my God. And we're at the end of the show, we're saying goodbye. I see her get taken up to the top. And I'm like, where the fuck is my wife? You know, it's a big goodbye. Me and Dave saying goodbye. She disappears. I come backstage. Evidently, she was up in the balcony throwing up all over my cousins. And she's oh. just, they bring her down. She's on a road case. She's fucking can't stand up, just throwing up everywhere, which is perfect. It's just like, I'm going to get in the car. I'm just gone. I don't want the awkward, oh, see you later or anything. This is my exit. Take her home through the, you know, I got, it's like a Dexter murder scene in my front. Uh, front seat of my car is just towels everywhere. Oh, and that brutal drive home on through the, the hills, hills through the hills, just the ah, oh, that's got to be gnarly on oh, her. Like, oh. It was late, so I was driving slow. We get her into bed, wake up the next day. It's just like, all right, baby, I'm home. You know, I'm going to give you a hand. You're, you're, you know, your boy's home. You just take it easy. Don't worry anything. I'm sitting at the, the foot of the bed and I get a text and I look at it. And it's from Carrie. And he's all, hey, man, <laughs> you know, uh, could you learn a set and be out here in a few days? And I like drop the phone literally I'm on the bed. And she's like, what is it? And I read it back to make sure that it's not like, you know, well, maybe perhaps or there's this chance. It's just like, no, we need we need you. And I show it to her. And she's like, fuck, you got to go. Wow. Did Carrie select you or was it Gary? I think it was Paul. Paul's girl. She's just like, they were, they were thinking of people. And I think Carrie was thinking of European people because they were over there. Right. And I think that Paul's girlfriend had mentioned, Hey, machine had just had their last show. So they're home. And so I think that Paul and Carrie, you know, were on it because Carrie's all, Hey, I need to still talk to Tom, get Tom on board. But you know, that was it, you know, and, wow. and per- might've saved my career at that point. It's just like, are you kidding? You know, you guys, you know, if I'm Slayer worthy, then fuck oh. everybody else. Yeah. Well, yeah, and I mean, just to be blasted into that spotlight. Now, they send you the set list, and of course, you know Slayer stuff like I do inside and out, but you got to sit down and le- learn Jeff's side. And also, there I think there's 15 songs in that set list. And there's all kinds of weird shit. You get, when you show up, you got to, oh, fuck, there's fire uh, cues that are unreal, these fire cues. So there's like all this shit you got to learn, you know, in a, in a matter of 24 hours. He, he had, uh, so in, after I had told him, yeah, I said, 
The boss said it was cool. I'm all, but you got to send me the set list now. I would need it now. And it was not, it was 19 songs. Um, and I know the first four records pretty good, but I have never really learned the, in, you know, all the inside pieces of all of them. So there's like maybe three or four that I could get through. So there was a lot of uh, Rosetta Stone type immersion of just like listening over and over. Okay. First for intro verse, introverse introverse first chorus you know it's just kind of rolling through everything and uh the whole flight over there okay so that happened on sunday monday is uh divorce day i'm going to the machine head storage to grab all my gear so i grab all my gear all day monday and then um tuesday i'm on a flight so i have not sat with a guitar until I'm flying over there. Oh my and, God. <laughs> and I've, uh, and so the whole flight over there, I've got my notes going down and I've, I've got my Spotify list and we take off and I forgot to download the Spotify list. So it's just like, I got to wait till the Wi-Fi kicks on. And oh. uh, so I'm, I'm mapping everything out, structuring everything out. And then uh, I land and my guitars don't show up. What? <laughs> so my guitars don't show up. Wait, were they checked in but didn't yes. show up? Oh they my didn't make, god! They didn't make it on the fucking flight. This is insane. <laughs> so I'm calling Scotty and I'm calling Mark Morton. I'm calling Willie and all the guys from Lam, you know, Lamb of God Anthrax guys, Johnny Rock and Roll, going, "Hey, you got a guitar?" No, they're all on the truck. You know, I can't. You know, so oh, carry because them. they're uh, touring with them. Wow! Right, right. So you don't even fucking. You can't. Oh, this is insane. So I get there and Carrie's got one guitar, but it's in drop B, which only one of the songs is in. Oh, so I'm able to work on that the songs called payback. So I I'm working on that tune. And then I just start going down the YouTube hole and just, you know, like, uh, ultimate tabs, you know, just learning, but no well, guitar or using that one. To I'm using the it. one guitar. Uh -huh. it's, it's got a, it's got a floating bridge on it. So it's stuck in that tuning. So oh. I'm, tra I'm transposing everything a step and a half sharp and trying to, you know, trying to hear by ear, but I have to put it back in the fret position <laughs> It was a fucking, it was an amazing experience, man. So when do your guitars get there or do they? So they get there the next day, the next day. Gary is uh, going to stay for a couple of shows. I'm going to shadow him for a couple of shows. So I have a couple of shows, a oh, couple great. of days to kind of go through stuff. And, and surprisingly, I'm super close before I even get to the, uh, to the venue. So I've got, you know, all the tunes, maybe a couple little parts here and there. And Gary helps him with a couple things. Carrie helps me with a couple things. They're playing and I'm just woodshedding, you know, their Slayer show is going on and I'm just fucking, you know, woodshedding right. and then go out. And then, so there was a show that I would able to watch where the pyro cues are and watch and his parent Carrie, I mean, Gary, would get right into the fire. Up. He'd get right up in there and just fucking, and it's hot as shit. Oh dude. my God. I was there the last two shows and I was at the monitor board on the side of the stage there. And that's like good, you know, 10 feet away. And I was like, Oh my God, this is like <laughs> kiss 79 shit, you know, right. 77, like, you know, 20 right. rows back in the old days where with kiss, those gas right. fucking pyros where you could feel it. Like, woo -hoo, yeah. You know? So Gary's going home to be with his father and say goodbye. Yeah. And um, in 2007, I told you about the incident that I had. Well, Machine Head, I left the tour for maybe three or four shows. And uh, the guys from Trivium, Arch Enemy, and Dragon Force kind of filled in for me while I was gone. And I came back for the last show. And so it was this whole full circle thing of me being able to come back and fill in in that capacity. Gary's going home and uh, so many. So one of the days we play, it's like the anniversary of Shona Mercy coming out 35 years later. And that was the reason why I was playing heavy music, you know, and I'm playing in the band on the anniversary that the record came out. Wow. And then the next day or maybe two days later was the anniversary of my father's death. And so having those memories come back and then the last show is in Finland at the ice hall in Helsinki. And that was the same venue where the machine head tour 2007 was in the same venue, the last day of the tour. So it's all these flooding of emotions and this it's, it was a really life affirming 
experience for me, man. It's just spectacular fashion that all these things have fucking happened. Were you using Gary's amps? Yeah. Yeah. Played right through his rig, played my guitars, pretty much used his settings, you know, pretty close. I used um, maybe a little bit of delay on some solos or something, but you know, it's the first show, dude, I'm just locked in, not smiling. You know, he can't smile and slayer. Just, just up, just playing the part and not even aware of all the shit that's going on behind me. Scrims dropping flames, blah, 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 blah. I'm just like Paul's monitor, Carrie's monitor, just playing the tunes. Yeah. And then the second one, I was able to enjoy a little bit more and embrace some of the pyro and jam with Paul and go over to Carrie's side and kind of take it all in. What'd you do? Two of them, right? I did four shows. Oh, you did four. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Pretty, pretty insane. Pretty insane. And there were scando crowds and they were, uh, cause it was Copenhagen, Oslo. There was a Sweden show and a Finland show. So the mo- little more reserved crowd, but it was still, you know, you've got, you got the feeling that you're playing fucking angel of death right now, or you're playing war ensemble right oh, now. And man, it's insane. Oh yeah. To me, it's fucking, <laughs> you know, that band, the last two nights to see those shows is just, mm-hmm. Just unreal. Yeah. You know? oh. yeah. I saw I saw you at that last show, right? Yeah. 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 It, was, it was it was fucking Aquaman's walking around and fucking Al Seed from True Blood. And fucking- <laughs> that was a the two two great days, man. What a yeah. primo funeral. <laughs> they did it right, man. They did yeah. it right. Yeah. Yeah. Before you uh were playing in, in violence and before you see Slayer and want to uh start playing heavy shit, you're at the same age as me. Of course, uh you grow up, it's it's Van Halen, it's A C D C and all that, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. My my cousin next door, Ron, he's like four years older than me. So he's uh he's got the fog hat, he's got the bad company, he's got the Aerosmith, he's got KISS. And I went, what the fuck is this? You know, and, and this alive, man. That was holy crap, man. Uh, then got into Nugent, got into uh, ACDC, but I was loving Journey, man. I oh, love Infinity. I love dude. Infinity. Infinity. Yep, yeah, that that one. And then I went backwards a little bit, and they were a little they were a little proggy for me. Like next, and the first record is cool. But that evolution came out and, you know, I, I was loving journey turned into priest, you know, turns into priest turns into maiden, you know, and then that starts the Metallica Slayer thing. But yeah, I was, I was all about, you know, love Nugent, love Daryl Smith. I didn't get to go, you know, I love seeing all your day on the green posts, man. Cause I didn't get to go, I couldn't go to a show until I was in high school. And that meant the summer before was 81, right. which was the day at uh, the Aussie. Right. Uh, Aussie Fourth of Heart. July with Hart yeah. and Cans. Or no, it was, it was Hart, Blue Oyster Colt, Pat Travers, Lover Boy, 0 5. So that was my first show. So I just, you know, a couple of years or you, you went to the, you went to all the killer ones, man. Yeah. With yeah. Mahogany Rush and ACDC and, you know, I'd fucking, well, you know, it's funny to think about, how big heart got on that one fucking record because they headlined day on the green. Yeah. That's how big that record was. Right, and it's right. crazy. And Ozzy was just a little fucking pinch at 11 a.m. Yeah, right? 10 know? a.m. in the morning. Yeah. So <laughs> it's really wild to think about um, how big heart got. Right. Right, wow. yeah. and they were killer, man. They Nancy were. up there with that Karina V wearing the green suit, you know. Oh, Nancy oh. Wilson. <laughs> I had her on the show, man, and it was just, really. Oh yeah, she was great. I talked about that Karina V, and oh, killer. She just fucking laid it down. She's rad. They both are are like, and I hate that you know, ah, Nancy. Yeah, she's a killer female guitar player. Bullshit. She's one of the best guitar players, gender aside, in the fucking world. Mike Inez, I talked to Inez about her sometimes, you know, just kind of like, what's Nancy like, man? And, you know, get kind of get the inside scoop from Mike because he played yeah. with them for a yeah. bit. And so what a great man Mike is. <laughs> he's amazing. No, there's no, that. that's the guy you want in your fucking band. 
He's Absolutely. like, he's never like, he's like, is it, isn't this great? <laughs> yeah, smile, yeah, perpetual yeah. smile. Yeah, and there's another guy like, we're so great about it. We didn't get a sound check and fucking food was bullshit. And he's like, yeah, man, but we're playing music. And yeah. I'm like, this fucking guy gets it. He does, man. He does. Oh. Yeah. Let's uh let's talk a little bit about Randy Rhodes. Uh I saw him uh two times, was supposed to see him three. Uh mm-hmm. one in Fresno at the selling arena that got canceled due to food poisoning. Right, you know? right. <laughs> but that guy really uh I mean to me it's all about that diary of a madman record. Yeah. It's it's like what I mean, first of all, they do those two records in one year. Right, right. And there ain't a bad song on either of them. Oh, man, man. And at the same time, you got Heaven and Hell and Mob Rules. So we got four of the greatest fucking records made from a band breakup. Totally. That's never happened. Nope. It's so fucking good. Um, I tell me about that that Fresno show. Was that on the Blizzard tour? That was the day before that Dan the Green. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. So, or two days before. So they were supposed to play selling arena and there's a station out in Fresno called KK DJ. And that's how I heard. I don't know. And all that first, you know, oh, okay. uh, they're playing the shit out of this re- uh, record. So I got the ticket and then, you know, that day it canceled. Right. And I was like, what the fuck? And was I talked about- on that. What's that? Was Motorhead opening that? You know what? I have no idea who the other bands were or anything. And okay. I barely even, uh, I, I scoured looking for the tour dates to see where it was. I finally found it, but I talked to, uh, I talked to Rudy about it and he goes, Oh yeah. The food poisoning excuse. Uh, Rudy then- remembers R- Rudy remembers everything. Yeah. He's, yeah. Oh, we stayed at the Holiday Inn and we yeah, ate at the yeah. fucking blah, blah, blah that night. And yeah, it's, yeah. it's awesome talking to him about it. Yeah. Man. Him and Tommy Aldridge. They both remember all of that. Really? Awesome. Yeah. Tommy is really on it. But uh, so I didn't get to see him there. Did you go to the night before New Year's Eve at yeah. Cow Palace? That was weird because the hand broke and we got right. robbed, we got robbed of the encores. Right, right, right. And the kabuki didn't fall in the beginning. Yeah, you know, it was just yeah. that loop of the ah uh, ah. Uh, uh, we're like, what the fuck's going on? You yeah, know? we got like a nine song set or whatever. Right, like, what the fuck? And that was the last time Randy came to the Bay Area, but. Right. Uh, what kind of influence did he have on your plane? Because up until then, are you straight up Eddie Van Halen? Uh, what What's going on? Man, you know, I I loved Eddie, but the reason why I picked up a guitar was Angus Young. Right. Um, you know, I was thinking drums in the beginning, but it just had too much shit. You know, there's just like, that's why I'm a snowboarder, not a skier. There's just too many parts, you know. And Angus was just like, I heard the ride on solo. And it's just like, man, you really felt what Angus was trying to express. And it's just like, that is, that's what I want to do. I want to do that. My playing, you know, I, I think most of Rose's influence on me is from his passion, from his conviction and his playing, you know, watching him. I mean, that was my first show, but he's a little tiny guy. He's a little dude and he owned the stage, man. You felt what he was doing and you loved his presence and, um, so I'm, I don't really, I'm inspired by his, I love what is playing in his classical style. I don't think that I emulate that in any way, maybe a couple of riffs here and there, but you know, it's just more about his passion for the music and for, and his conviction on stage. Yeah. Also, uh, one of the guys that really, uh, slammed it home as far as, uh, equipment, the black and white marshals, yeah. the, the polka dotted v the right. concord and then the cream les paul each right. one in his arsenal was just primo rigs you know and then later right. the black concord with the brass that kirk hammett gets later also i know right <laughs> uh, everything you see about randy his outfits his haircut was cool because he wasn't that cool and quiet right he was cool but he wasn't like that right right right, right. and it really kind of all came together and his vision of just kind of that day at day in the green out there with the goddamn if you look at that photo that uh ross halfen took from behind the amps 
and uh-huh. you, you see his pedal board and it's yeah. like eight feet long, <laughs> you know, and, and he's just smiling and right. oh God, I just got goosebumps. Totally like, right. It's, it's, so it's, it's, you see that picture and I'm all, I'm all like, I think I was right over here. I was right in this area, right over here. I think that uh, I think that Ozzy used to call the the pedal board the frying pan because it just hissed and it was psh, psh, lots of fucking noise. It, it was giant too. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my god! They had it at uh, down at the Nokia down in uh, in L.A. They had it at the the Grammy Museum or whatever. Oh, they had it in there. The pedal yeah, board? it was in there. It was in there. Whoa! Pretty, it was pretty awesome. I think they had a couple of couple of things from him. So. I had Grover Jackson on the show uh, a couple weeks ago. I got awesome. another, yeah, I got another podcast called The Grail, where I have uh, people that are artists on uh, builders, creators, you know, guitars, uh-huh. cars, boots, denim, uh, you know, whatever. So I had him on, and and for him, he was describing just you know that napkin showing up with the Concord body. Oh, on. Right. oh, let's do something like this, and and all that. Let's let's get a little bit into your guitars. Uh, being an Angus guy, was it first an SG, or where did you start? And uh, did you ever have one of those classic Charvel San Dimas ones? No, I didn't. I didn't have. Uh one of the Charvels. I started with, you know, you get your, your Memphis copies. And my actual first guitar was, uh, I had a paper route back in the day. And, you know, I asked my parents, Hey, I want to play guitar. And they said, all right, well, you know, we'll match you whatever you save. And do you remember Jimco? Remember the department yeah. score? Yeah. yeah. So had, there was a Jimco in town and it's like a membership. You had to have a card to get in. So if we were out walking around, we had to kind of piggyback on some family or something like that and walk in with the family. So, you know, like, yeah, we're with them or, and they had in their above their eight tracks and their cassettes, they had, you know, some instruments on the wall and they had like a some Les Paul knockoff. It didn't even have a didn't even have a, a, a make on it, but it was 42 bucks. And I saved up twenty one dollars from my paper route. And my you worked pen. nine months for that. <laughs> and then they you know, the thing about the paper route was we had. We had to go collect. Oh, we had to go collect. Yeah. You know, yeah, some was, people mailed the people. I was a, I was delivered the trib out here, so it was Oakland Tribune, and you put out the envelopes, and some people would send you checks, and then you had to go to the bank, and then you had to, you know, you had to do all the work. So I got the twenty one bucks. I brought it home, started taking a little bit of lessons, learning a little, you know, lights by Journey, and you know, learning some ACDC stuff, and. Uh, I got a Cortez flying V. Oh yeah. Cortez. Yeah. <laughs> so I, uh, there was a local band. I don't know if you remember violation. They were the guitar player, singer, Perry photos was, uh, my substitute teacher at junior high. So violation. Yeah. They played the, the stage in Danville. There was a, ba- a club out here called the stage that they would play. And, uh, they had a guitar player. His name was Paul Harris. And he was like a Michael Shanker, you know, he played the V. He looked like Shanker. He had the kind of permed blonde hair. And, you know, they were a great rock band, man. And and so I just, I wanted to play a V, you know. And, yeah. and so I had the Cortez V for a while. And then I was able to afford a Ibanez Destroyer. Oh, killer. Main so, style. Adrian yeah, Smith. Adrian, for sure. And, and so it was like my first real guitar. You know, it was an, it was an Ibanez. It was like my first real guitar. Um, got into, uh, I start, you know, I have that through my violence days and then, uh, my guitar player in violence at the time had acquired, uh, one of the shark fin, the Rhodes shark fins, like the, one yeah. of the early ones, man. And he knew that I, you know, I was a Rhodes guy and I wanted it. And so he's like, yeah, you know, some guy owed him money for pot or something. So he took his, he, so he took his V, you know, and my teenage rationale. I was like, yeah, that's legitimate. You know, that's it's well, your guitar. My Coke dealer has my fucking, uh, <laughs> Charvel to this day. I had, oh, a, man. Yeah, I had the star body one, man. Red. Oh man. Fucking got me on a, a late nighter. Dude, <laughs> dude, let me get an ounce. <laughs> you know? I thought I was going to sell the ounce, then make a bunch of money, pay him back. And no, then that never out. happened. Didn't get home with it. <laughs> Didn't get home with it. That needs to be a shirt. I'll just do a couple bumps and sell the rest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he has the guitar. He's all, hey, trade me this for that. And then so I, I have the guitar. You look on Eternal Nightmare, you see it. It's that white and black, you know, Rhodes. And so we're playing the Omni. 
sold out, sold out show. And in the middle of it, one of the, the older monitor guy kind of had a skull. It. I forget what his name was, but he's oh bro. I hate to do this to you, but come here. And so mid show sold out, you know, mid show in between songs, I walk outside and boom, three Oakland cops, the dude whose guitar it is, his mom and his girlfriend. They're all like, going, they're like, yeah, that's my guitar. So they fucking, I'm cuffed. Oh, oh. They take the guitar. I'm cuffed in the back of the car, of the yeah. cop car outside the Omni. Meanwhile, violence is still playing inside. Sean's up there. Oh, Phil doesn't get butt fucked in jail, you know. Whoa, they're playing without you, huh? True mid, story. Wait, True mid story. show? Mid you have show. to leave the stage? <laughs> This so is I'm in insane. the insane. They're playing. I'm in the cop car outside. Yeah. My dad, my dad was at the show. He always, my parents always went to the shows yeah. the days, and he was an ex Oakland cop. So oh, shit, I got his fucking badge right here. Oh so yeah. He, so he that goes, was a cop. So, so he goes outside and flashes his badge. Yeah. yeah City of Oakland. Whoa. And, and uh flashes his badge and says, What's going on? Yeah, you know, it's my son. And they're all, oh, well, you know. He's possession of stolen, blah, blah, blah. And I'm a, the dude knows I didn't steal it. You know, he yeah, knows yeah. That I didn't take it. He's like, yeah, I just wanted my guitar back. No, no charges are pressed. They let right. me go. So I go in through that, not the corner door. At the you didn't say, Hey, you traded it for drugs. You loser. <laughs> <laughs> no, that came later. That came oh, later. Oh, wow, wow. I just, I was, my mind was just on the show that's going on inside, you know? So I bust through the front door, not the one that's on the bar level, you know, in the corner. So I bust through the front door, run through the crowd, do a stage dive, get up and borrow the, uh, I think Hex was opening or something like that. So I borrow a guitar player from them and finish the show. <laughs> what? <laughs> Fucking crazy shit, dude. Mid show that mon fuck that monitor guy. Like, yeah, I'll get him off stage for you. Like what the fuck is just sold out? I know, right? You know? Oh my Can't God. you wait? Dude, that's yeah, a so. fucking great story, man. So that was my first Jackson. Yeah. And so so we're signed at the time, and now we're going in to do the second record, and Debbie's managing us, and she's all, well, you need a guitar. And so uh went back and got another shark fin, 1988. Whoa, you still Jackson. got it? Yeah, I still got it, man. Whoa, what color is it? It's black. What, with the brass hardware? The gold? No, it's all black. Oh, wow. All black. Yeah. What year is that? 88. That's fucking cool. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Kayla or Floyd Rose? It's got a Floyd. Oh, man. Yeah. I, I like the fucking hardtail ones, man. Yeah, those are, I got, well, of course, you know, with my time with Jackson, I've yeah, I've gotten every guitar that's fallen off the back of every truck. So yeah, <laughs> I've, got quite yeah. a, I've got quite a collection. So I, I do have a hardtail. No shit. But yeah, they're, they're great, man. Yeah, they are great. Uh, and then what are you on uh, for amps now? Uh, playing P PV sixty five oh fives, PV. Huh? With, yeah, I've been with PV for for a while now. The fifty original fifty one fifty, the sixty five oh fives. Uh, been kind of cheating on them a little bit with the EVHs with the fifty one fifty threes. You know the they make an EL. Do I have one in here? No, but they make like an EL thirty thirty four edition. Oh wow, that I like a lot. So. Were you ever uh, back in the day? I know you go the classic, which was the MG eighty one pickup. But were you ever uh, in the triple rectifier Mesa world? No, no, never, never got into that. Never, huh? Never, never did the Mesa, man. Wow, Mesa. that was such a great Metallica thing, you know. It was. It yeah. was. I was more. I was more Marshall, JMP back then. Yeah, uh, great. I had, the, I had the Jubilee. I had the silver Jubilee. Oh, that's head. fucking Black Crows right there. Yeah, that's the best. Really good. Yeah, so I'm still doing the EMGs. Um, I've got here, let me grab one for you. I've got a new uh, I was doing the V for a while, but I'm doing oh, I've kind of I've kind of taken it style, yeah. I've kind of taken they call it an extroyer, so it's it's a destroyer explorer, and this is the, the new demolition. Oh, that's fucking it's sick. a signature, pretty cool. Wow, man. Let's see the headstock real quick. Yeah, Holy the six shit. Six on the side. You know, did you see that um, Phil Collin, Jackson made him a uh, replica of his fucking three pickup Ibanez so one? So good. Oh, so and, good. It's, and it's all black. It's rad. The fucking pick guard, the tremolo, the rings, yep. everything, man. God, yep. that's a badass guitar, man. Yeah. And then I've got a, uh, you can see it in the back, the, uh, I got a fixed bridge. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know what I, um, 
I really like that Hetfield early era ESP. He was mm -hmm. playing the Explorers. Yeah. And they made the one with the snakes on the fretboard. I've been trying to find one for 15 years on eBay. They made like a hundred or something. Oh, you know, shit. Different ones, but they were, you know, you get one with the snakes, all from the Black Album era. That's awesome. And, and those are sick. Uh, Fernie had one from Jet Boy and he fucking oh, right unfortunately on. sold it, but goddamn uh you know guitars are great huh <laughs> yeah for sure for sure i've been uh i've got a storage full of them <laughs> oh. well you might be selling those things give me yeah. a ring <laughs> i don't think so man the wife was even bringing that up because we you know we own a bar i'm a musician so it's strike one and two right now in the pandemic so we're just you know we're getting through it but she's like, hey, uh, what's happening with our storage? And getting into like, hey, uh, if we're paired on, you know, nope, nope, necessary expense. <laughs> what? Uh, let's talk real quick before we get out of here about your bar. You guys bought a bar. That's pretty cool. And what what is the flavor of the bar? It's uh, it's called the Back Lounge and uh, it's a sports bar, uh, Sports bar, but it's got like, um, we've got shuffleboard and the pool tables and the darts and everything. And, uh, but I've got these cool, I'm, I rocked it out with some, um, I got a bunch of drummers to donate some sticks and we made these chandeliers out of the drumsticks. So we got, we got Lars, we got Lombardo, we've got Troy Lucchetta, we got Benante and Portnoy and, um, all these guys and they each have their own little drum hanging or, uh, drum stick chandelier hanging the poles on the bathrooms are jackson guitar necks wow the pool table lights are drums with these uh led tape lighting on them and and people that you know famous buds that come in i have them sign them so it's it's a sports bar but it's really eclectic man we can get we get hip hopper hoppers in there sometimes we get the country boys coming in sometimes and is it in dublin yeah wow yeah. wow and uh and you guys have been shut down obviously since march uh, 15th right we opened for three months september october november while we were able to serve outside we had to yeah. mark off some of the parking lot and so we were open for three months and that was kind of fun and got into do some karaoke i had a comedy night oh um, shit comedy you know sean, night. do you know uh sean boyles and mean dave from up here i don't okay so they're local dudes comedians and so they started a comedy night on there and went really well so oh, that's great looking, looking forward to doing more of that you uh you a comedy guy big comedy guy what do you watch i'm not i'm not i'm not not usually you know i can appreciate i, I haven't watched much lately but i know all the you know yeah all the famous ones but i mean it was cool to get those guys come in sometimes i go to tommy t's as a group you know and we'll go see right. some local guys over here and uh before we go where are you at with rob now still nothing um, I haven't talked to him pretty much since the end. Yeah. It's fine. I just, I just brought that up because I know during the pandemic, you sit there for a long time and you think about like stuff that you're going, well, and eh, none of that shit matters now, you know, like, uh, some of it still kind of matters. Yeah. Oh no, I get it. I'm saying with me when, when you know, I, I sit around and think about like, but yeah, yeah I get it. I, get I, it. I don't, I don't have any desire or need to talk to him ever again. There you go. There you go. Well, it was great to talk to you. <laughs> and, yeah, you and, too, man. And uh, I, I know you hit me up to sing a song during the thing. And I was just, yes. kinda, I was more <laughs> kind of in this, uh, you know, just funk of like, what the fuck? I'm not working or anything. You know what I mean? But if you do do one later on, count me in and I'll do yeah, it. Yeah, you want to rock out? Yeah. Yeah. These collab jams I've been doing, it were super fun, man. We did Billy Sheehan and me and uh, Soto did uh, Van Halen too. We did Lost Control. I don't know if you checked. That, that, that was great. That uh, one. That was great. Did Revelation Mother Earth with, yeah. uh, with Rudy. And, you know, so I'm doing one right now that uh, I don't think that you'd be good for. And you're going to find out when I tell you what it is when we're not talking on. Okay. You know, yeah. <laughs> we're on yeah, the yeah. record, but, but I would love to, I would love to jam. What, what, ACDC, what what do you want yeah. to do? Yeah, yeah. Band. I'm down with ACDC, uh, you know. Uh whatever, man. Just throw some at me. Rock and roll. All right. Yeah. yeah. I'd love I'd love to rock out with you, man. Have you done an ACDC one? No, I haven't done one yet. No. Oh yeah, then let's do that. We're yeah. gonna do that. All right. Yeah. Let's All we right. gotta you gotta put it together. You gotta think of who you want on it. 
You put it together and just hit me up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Oakland Tribune, you know, yeah, you deliver our paper. You uh, <laughs> that to me. <laughs> it was great talking to you. And you, too, uh, you, you got an Instagram, right? Tell everybody that. Uh, just Phil Demo. Yep. And HIL uh, Demo. Looking YouTube. forward to hearing the uh, violence uh, EP coming up. And uh, thank you so much, man. Stay healthy. Keep you rocking. Too, bro. We'll and see you soon. I, I hope to see you in 2021 somehow. It'll happen. Thanks. See you, buddy. Good, Later, man.